Good morning, everybody. So happy to have you joining us this morning. My name is Molly Dunks, and I am with the Wisconsin Department of Employee Trust Funds. And joining me here today is Christy Mulcahy with WebMD and Rebecca Parks from Dean Health Plan. Together, along with some of our other group health insurance program vendors, we have put together this training for you all on advanced care planning. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards, and you can find supporting documents in the handout section. If you don't see the handout section, you can email well wi employer support at webmd.net, which Christy did drop in the chat uh, feature. As you have questions arise throughout this training, please feel free to enter them in the questions section of the webinar panel and we will address all questions at the end of our session today. So next I'll turn it over to Rebecca. She is a social worker with Dean Health Plan Medica. She's been working there for five years, although she has over 18 years of experience as a social worker in the healthcare field. She received her bachelor's degree from Cardinal Stritch University and her master's degree from UW-Madison. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca. Thanks, Molly. Um, what a privilege it is to be here today to um, speak with you all about this really important subject that's very difficult at times to talk about. Um, so again, the title of this presentation is Have a Voice in Your Care, Advanced Care Planning and Directives. Um, again, I will reiterate, please do put questions in the questions box as we will you know, I will make sure to leave time at the end to answer any questions you might have. So today we're gonna to discuss um, really what is advanced care planning, um, why it's important, and the steps um, for advanced care planning and completing your advanced directives. We're also gonna provide tips for starting the conversation with others and definitely explore resources to assist in completing your um, advanced directives and starting the advanced care planning process. So what is advanced care planning? Um, I guess the key word I like to use when I talk about advanced care planning is that it's a process. Um, it's not a one-time event, but it's a process of thinking about your wishes and communicating your wishes um, for if your health should change in the future, if you should have a sudden, unexpected medical event, um, it's what would your wishes be? So it, again, it's, it's that communication, um, that thought process, um, thinking about your wishes, and as well as documenting your wishes. So once you've thought about your wishes, started the conversation with your loved ones, you wanna document your wishes and advance directives. And we really want everyone to start now. Um, everyone over the age of 18 in Wisconsin should um, complete advance directives. So why is advanced care planning important? Uh, we want to make sure that the care you receive um, is what you what you would want. Um, so the care you receive can better be reflective of your wishes if you start the advanced care planning process. Um, your loved ones won't have to guess if they've made the right choice. Um, that's something as a social worker in the healthcare field that I've witnessed several times is. Um, family members and loved ones feeling guilty about, have I made the right decision? Is this something my dad or mom or son would have wanted? Um, so by having the conversations, your loved ones are just being your voice. Um, they're reflecting what you would want and they, they don't have to realize, you know, live with the guilt of, am I making the right decision? Um, your healthcare team would be aware of your treatment preferences. Um, so we, when we talk about advanced care planning, we also encourage people to bring in their healthcare providers into the conversation as well. Um, and it can reduce unwanted care, treatment, and hospitalizations. Um, so having these conversations can help 
you know, if you want to remain at home for end of life, if you don't want to be resuscitated, you know, having these conversations can help you reduce getting treatments that you don't want and receiving treatments that you do want. Um, and then your agent has legally recognized status as a decision maker. So by completing advanced directives, which we'll get into um, shortly, it gives uh, your loved one the legal status to make decisions on your behalf. So the steps to advanced care planning um, is first thinking about what's important to you as a whole person. So any personal, cultural, or religious beliefs that may affect your treatment decisions. But I want you to take it one step further and think about, you know, what's important to you? Um, what, what does a good day look like for you? What brings you a good quality of life? Um, you know, look at yourself as a whole person in terms of, um, you know, your physical abilities. Um, you know, I think of a, a patient I worked with once who loved doing laundry, and that was important to be able to continue to do laundry. So kind of what brings your life quality. Um, so kind of thinking of yourself as a whole being and what would be important to you. Um, the second step is to choose a decision maker. So if I can't make my own healthcare decisions, who knows me well? Who do I trust? Who do I want to step in and make medical decisions on my behalf? Um, and we'll go into a little bit. Um, we'll go into choosing a, a healthcare agent a little bit more, in, a little bit more depth in terms of kind of what you might want to think about when choosing an agent. Um, and discuss and decide on your care goals in the event of a severe, ac severe accident or illness. So, you know, you've thought about your beliefs and wishes. You've chosen your decision maker. Now it's time to sit down and speak to them about what your wishes would be. Um, I think about my mom, who is adamant about staying at home, and I know she's spoken to her provider and to me as well that, you know, her goal would be to have hospice at home. Um, so, you know, what are your wishes? You know, what what brings you a good quality of life? And really, the, the biggest step, I believe, is that communication and the talk that you're going to have with your loved ones. Um, and then after you've completed those three steps, now it's time to complete your advanced directive documents. So now you're going to want to sit down and complete the power of attorney for health care and the living will, which we'll discuss further. So I think we touched on this a little bit already, but again, reflecting on your values, beliefs, and wishes. So, um, you know, who and what matter most to me? Um, what treatments do I want or not want? Um, where do I want to spend my last days? Um, you know, is it important to have certain people with me? Do I want certain music playing? Um, these are all things that you want to think about in terms of reflecting on your wishes. And I know it's not the easiest thing to do, but um, it definitely is a gift that you're giving to your loved ones and to yourself to think about these things and start the conversation. And these, you know, reflecting on your wishes should occur, again, as a process, right? Because I think how sometimes we feel in our 20s might be different than how we feel in our 40s and 60s and 80s, et cetera. You know, we have a lot of life experiences. So this is a, a continual process of reflecting on what's important to you and, you know, updating and letting your loved ones know if things change with your values, beliefs, or wishes. Um, I remember I, I was working with someone in their 20s who was like, you know, I want everything done. If something happens to me, I want to be resuscitated. I want to be on ventilators. And then a few years later, she reached out to me again and wanted to update her document because she had seen some horrific things happen in, in her personal life with loved ones and had decided that, you know, that's, that's no longer what her wishes are. So definitely continuing to think about and reflect on your wishes. So choosing a decision maker, this is, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, this can be a, a challenge because you want to think about who you can trust um, and who uh, will follow your wishes. So, 
Um, the first step is, you know, you do want to talk to the person you're thinking of um, nominating just to make sure that they feel comfortable in the role. Because sometimes we think somebody would be good, but then we speak with them and they're not comfortable or they feel like they wouldn't be able to respect our wishes. So the first step, in, I would say, is definitely, you know, making sure that the person is agreeable to being your health care agent. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, on the um, power of attorney for health care document, there is um, a section for two health care agents, a primary agent and an alternate agent. You can add more agents if you would like. I do encourage that you use num numerical uh, orders of how you want them to go. So this is the first person I want. This is the second person I want. This is the third person I want. Um, we um, don't encourage joint agents because that can get really, really sticky, even in the most loving of families. Um, so we, we don't encourage joint agents, but, you know, having a primary agent and then a backup agent. Um, so once you've located the people you want to nominate and you've spoken to them and they're agreeable, you're going to want to talk to them about your values and goals and preferences. Um, and again, we, you really want to make sure that they're going to follow your choices, even if they don't agree with that, with, with them. Um, and you also want to think, is this somebody who can make decisions during a difficult decision? I remember a colleague of mine in the past had a healthcare agent picked, had completed her documents, had spoken to them, and then had a family member die and saw how her agent kind of handled that situation and thought, oh boy, you know, I don't know if I want them to be my healthcare agent after seeing how they responded. So she, she changed her um, directives. So, you know, you can, you know, you, you want somebody who can be there and make difficult decisions. Um, I also added have avail availability via telephone. Um, a common question I get is, can my healthcare agent live in another state or reside far away? Um, and yes, they can. You just want to make sure that they're available by telephone. And I actually tell people, if the person you trust lives in California and you're thinking of nominating, let's say, a friend who lives locally in Wisconsin, but you think the person in California would better respect your wishes, that's who I would nominate. I wouldn't necessarily nominate someone based on where they live. Um, you really want somebody who is going to respect and be a good voice and a good advocate for you. So the role of the healthcare agent um, is to make choices about your medical care, arrange for medical care and treatment, uh, review and release medical records, uh, make decisions on living situations, and decide which health providers um, can provide treatment. So it is, it is a pretty serious role, and it's a role that, depending on how we decline, if we get, um, let's say, all, uh, dementia, this could be a role that our healthcare agent is in for several years. So really thinking about who your agent, who you want your agent to be and speaking with them um, is very important. Um, I do want to point out that um, there are a couple terms that have come up in the recent years called solo agers, um, elder orphans, um, and elders without benches. And these are all terms to reflect on that there are some people who don't have anybody to nominate as their health care agent. Um, and we have been, I've been in my role with Dean Health Plan as the Advanced Care Planning Social Worker, I've been seeing this quite a lot when I work with people um, and, and they'll mention, you know, I don't have anybody I trust. So sometimes I would encourage people to kind of think outside, um, you know, your typical, I'm going to nominate my child or my spouse. Uh, and thinking outside, is there someone at church who you trust? Is there somebody, um, a next door neighbor or a friend? Um, is there a distant relative? Sometimes there, there isn't anyone. Um, and in that case, um, there is a local organization in Dane County that we sometimes refer people to that have um, actually people you can hire to be your health care agent. Um, or I encourage people to complete the living will document and to, you know, 
highly encourage them to speak with their uh, providers about their wishes. So this is definitely something we're seeing more of, and it'll be interesting to see how the state of Wisconsin handles that going forward um, as we have a lot of people aging without um, support networks. Um, so definitely let's dive in a little bit and talk about the Wisconsin Advanced Directives. So um, the Declaration to Physicians, um, it's actually the name changed back in 2020, and it's now called the Declaration to Healthcare Professionals. It's also known as the Wisconsin Living Will. That's the document where you make note of what your wishes would be if you had a terminal condition or were in a pers persistent vegetative state. Would you want life-sustaining procedures and would you want feeding tubes used? So this is a guide to your healthcare professionals and to your loved ones about what your wishes would be in those specific situations. This is a great document to complete. I always encourage people, if you're going to complete the power of attorney for healthcare, it's, it's worth also doing the Wisconsin Living Will. I do like to let people know that the living will, the Wisconsin living will, is not valid during pregnancy. Um, so I still encourage you, even if you're pregnant, to do it. I like to joke that we spend most of our lives not pregnant, so doing the, the Wisconsin living will is a good idea. Um, the power of attorney for health care uh, is um, the document where you make note of who you would want to step in to make your medical decisions. So this document doesn't go into details about what your wishes are, but it's more so saying, these are the people I want making my decisions for me. Um, and then within the Wisconsin Power of Attorney for Healthcare, it asks you specific questions about admission to a nursing home and community-based residential facility for long-term care. Um, it asks about withholding or withdrawing a feeding tube, and it asks about healthcare decisions for pregnant women. So what I like to tell people, because a lot of, you can do these documents on your own, you don't need to have an attorney, and um, you can see on the slide that there is the website on where to download and, and uh, make copies of the documents. Those questions aren't asking, do you want a feeding tube? Do you want to go to a nursing home for long-term care? It's asking, can your healthcare agents make those decisions for you if you're not able to make your own decisions? So I always like to clarify that because I'll work with somebody and let's say they check no to the nursing home and they'll say, oh, I never want to go to a nursing home. And then I speak further to them and I say, okay, this question isn't asking, do you want to go to a nursing home? I think most of us would check no to that question. It's asking, can your healthcare agents make that decision for you? And then usually most people will say, okay, I do. I trust my agents. I've told them I don't want to go, but I don't want to put any barriers in their way. So they'll complete a new document to check yes. Um, and once you've completed the Declaration to Healthcare Professionals and the Power of Attorney for Healthcare documents, you're going to need your signature witnessed by two people that are not related to you by blood, marriage, adoption, or domestic partnership. And once your signature is witnessed, all the dates will line up because your signature is being witnessed, so it's all happening on the same day. You're, um, you're going to distribute copies, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. The last two documents, the Power of Attorney for Finance and Property, um, on the DHS website, there is a document that you can fill out for finance and property. That's not a document that I assist people with, um, but it is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then there's also the authorization for final disposition. And this is one of my, I want to say one of my favorite forms for people thinking about funeral planning because it gives you the ability to nominate who you would want to make your uh, final arrangements, make your funeral decisions for you. Um, once we die, our power of attorney for health care and living will die with us. So um, in terms of the authorization for final disposition, that allows you, if you don't want your next of kin making your final arrangements, it allows you to nominate who you would want to make your medical decisions. So again, the note on the bottom of the screen, really everyone over the age of 18, unless they have a guardian in place, should complete an advanced directive. 
Um, and I really stress this in Wisconsin because we are not a next of kin state when it comes to our health care. So if we don't have an advanced directive on file and certain decisions need to be made, our family or loved ones may need to go to court to get guardianship. So having these documents completed really gives you that power and control of who do I want to step in to make my decisions for me. I kind of, I, I was telling um, the ETF staff when we were preparing this that, especially when I work with young people, I kind of compare um, the advanced directives to um, car insurance in the sense that, you know, we pay for car insurance. We hope we never need it. We have it there just in case. That's kind of how I look at the, at the advanced directives is having these conversations, thinking about our wishes, documenting our wishes, and really hoping we don't need to use these documents, but having them just in case. So once um, you've um, completed the advanced directives, you do want to um, provide copies to your healthcare agents, um, your primary care clinic, and any other health organization where you doctor at. Um, I, I also encourage people to put your original copy somewhere safe in your home that's easily accessible. Um, in my previous role as a hospice social worker, I can't tell you how many times somebody had it in a lockbox and they were the only one with the combination and they were no longer able to, you know, provide that information. So you do want to have your documents, all, I would say all your legal documents readily available for um, your loved ones to access. Um, again, we can't say this enough, but talking to your loved ones about your documents and wishes. And then, and then again, the third is keeping your original um, where it can be easily found. So when does the healthcare agent's authority begin? So um, the power of attorney for healthcare in Wisconsin must be activated. So a lot of times I work with people and they're concerned about completing their advanced directives because they don't want to give, they're worried they're giving their authority away by completing the document. But the document must be activated by two providers who have examined you and determined that you can no longer make your medical decisions and they sign a statement of incapacity stating that, you know, you're no longer able to make your medical decisions. As of, I believe it was January 2020, right before COVID, the state of Wisconsin changed the power of attorney for health care. So if you've completed a power of attorney for health care since 2020, and it states in the document that the two providers can be either um, a physician and or psychologist, or it can be a physician and um, advanced practice nurse practitioner and physician or physician's assistant. So they kind of have widened who can um, activate the documents, but it's, it still needs to be two people. Um, the document can be deactivated. So um, let's say you're in a horrible accident um, and you can't make your decision after the accident. You go to rehab, you regain your mental um, faculties, and now you're able to make your, your own decisions. It takes one physician to deactivate the document. Organ donation. So this is um, really important that we, we talk about organ donation with our loved ones as well. So on the Power of Attorney for Healthcare document, um, it does ask about if you would want to be a, um, if you would want to donate anatomical gifts. Um, so if you check no on your power of attorney for health care, but let's say you have the orange dot on your driver's license, they go by whichever was more recent. Um, I do encourage people, if you do complete the organ donation question on the power of attorney for health care and state you do want to be an organ donor, making sure you have the dot on your driver's license as well um, and letting your family know you want to be an organ donor. Um, I, we, right before COVID, um, we had the UW anatomical gift department come and speak to our department. And it was really interesting because they want people to answer that question based on, would you want to be an organ donor? Not, um, you know, can I be an organ donor? Because sometimes people say, oh, I've had, you know, I have this wrong with me or I'm old. Nobody would want my 
my uh, organs, but they really want you to answer that question of if I can donate, would I want to donate? Um, and then they gave the really great statistic that the oldest um, tissue donor was in her 90s. So, you know, being a, not just an organ donor, but also a skin or tissue donor is needed as well. And we also included the UW Body Donation Program and the UW Brain Donation Program. Um, the Body Donation Program, you do have to register for ahead of time. And they do encourage you to still pick a funeral home if they're not able to um, accept your body. But please do go on the, webs on the websites provided to learn more. Um, Wisconsin do not resuscitate. So do not resuscitate is saying that you would not want called cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which is an emergency procedure that combines chest compressions, often with artificial ventilation, in an effort to manually preserve intact brain function until further measures are taken to restore spontaneous blood circulation and breathing in a person who is in cardiac arrest. Um, so in the state of Wisconsin, um, in order to be a do not resuscitate, it is a physician order. Um, in the hospital, they might ask you, do you want to be an organ? I'm sorry, do you want to be resuscitated? You say, no, I do not. They put a pretty purple bracelet on you. You wear that throughout your hospital stay. The minute you leave the hospital, you become a full code again, which means they will provide CPR. If you want to be a do not resuscitate in the community, you will need to speak to your primary care provider and receive a community physician order, in which point they'll provide you with a plastic Wisconsin do not, do not resuscitate bracelet, as well as information on how to obtain a metal bracelet. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, it is, is a law that you have to wear the bracelet in order to not be resuscitated. Um, so if you're not wearing the bracelets, something happens to you in public, somebody calls 911, they will resuscitate you. Um, the POLST in Wisconsin, that's the Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. I have, do not see that used as often um, as it is in other states, but that's a document that you fill out with your physician that talks about what your wishes are in regards to resuscitation, feeding tubes, et cetera, end-of-life wishes. And then both you and the physician sign the form and it goes in your record. Um, the POLST is used a lot more in other states, uh, more so than it is in Wisconsin. So tips for starting the conversation. I know we only have a couple minutes left. Um, so definitely starting as early as possible. Um, you, I always tell people you can use this webinar as a reason to start the conversation. You know, I went to this webinar and this woman named Rebecca said that we should really start this conversation. Um, so um, also using life events, you know, um, bringing up the conversation with loved ones about maybe you had someone close to you die, talking about their death and how maybe it impacted your own wishes, um, asking open-ended questions. Um, exploring and listening, you know, um, life goals, um, where do you find strength and support, spiritual and cultural considerations. I always say it's not an easy conversation to start. Some people don't want to have the conversation. Um, if, you're, if you're running into a wall and people don't want to have the conversation, it's okay to write down your wishes. Let your loved ones know where your wishes are so that if there comes a point in time where they want to talk about them further, they know where they're stored and you can maybe start the conversation at a later date, but definitely starting the conversation as early as possible before a crisis. And here are some great resources. Um, the Conversation Project, I really want to point out because they provide the act an actual starter pack on how do you start advanced care planning. Um, and great resource, they have videos, um, I would highly recommend you check out their website. The Guardianship Support Center in Dane County, anyone in Wisconsin can access and use their support. The Wisconsin Medical Society, um, the National Resource Center for Psychiatric Advanced Directives. Um, the Advanced Directive for Dementia is great if you're working with someone or your loved one has dementia. Um, it is not a legal document, but it does definitely help you 
um, determine um, what your loved one's wishes would be with their dementia. And then UW Health um, has free advanced care planning virtual workshops. You can um, go to their website as well. Um, thank you to ETF um, and the group health insurance program for inviting me to provide on this important uh, provide information on this important topic and thank you for listening um, any questions yeah hi rebecca um this is christy and there were a few questions in the chat so i just wanted to bring those up for you um, before we go into questions i just want to point out to everybody that's listening and part of the well wisconsin program um, that you can pull out that um, how to claim your um, well-being activity by participating in this webinar, and that's one of your handouts. So if you want to look at that, you can see how you can get that credit. Um, okay, so one of the questions here is, um, I'm a snowbird and live part-time in Wisconsin and part-time in Arizona. So am I supposed to complete forms with both states, and how does that work? That is a great question, and usually I bring that up. So you want to complete the form of where your residency is. So um, because whenever we update our documents, so let's say we complete a Wisconsin document and then you complete an Arizona document, the Arizona document will, will make the Wisconsin document null and void. You can only have one advanced directive or power of attorney for health care at a time. So I would choose the state where you are more of a permanent resident, maybe where you seek most of your health care. So if that's, you know, Wisconsin, that would be great. Or if that's Arizona, the bar in Wisconsin for what needs to be in a power of attorney for health care is pretty high compared to other states. So, um, you know, again, whichever state you reside in, but if this is your permanent address per se, I would I would uh, do the Wisconsin document and then bring it with you and keep a copy in your home in Arizona. That way, if anything should happen in Arizona, you'll have a document. Your power of attorney for health care, regardless of where you complete it, is respected in other states. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, there's also another question here. Um, what happens if you don't have these forms filled out and something um, happens? So who is has the ultimate, excuse me, the ultimate um, say in my health care if I'm not able to communicate? So if it's an emergency situation, they will go to next of kin. Um, however, if some other decisions need to be made, for example, nursing home placement, feeding tubes, um, if you need rehab, if you need to be transferred, other decisions in the hospital that aren't emergent, but you can no longer make your own decisions, then your loved ones will have to go to court and seek guardianship. So um, really, we do encourage um, people to get their documents done to avoid the guardianship piece. Because guardianship is very expensive. It can be thousands of dollars. And your loved one is basically just sitting in the hospital until guardianship is sought. So um, we want people to avoid that process and really have a voice of who, who do I want to make my decisions for me. But if you don't have an advanced directive and it's an emergency, it would go to next of kin. Great. We also do have, and I know you, um, we did have a question about, um, uh, two questions really along the same line about, and you, you talked about this in the webinar. Um, what if you, if I don't have anyone um, to nominate as a healthcare agent? And I know you talked about some of those resources for that. And along that line, somebody was also asking, what was that organization in Dane County that would help provide advocates for hire? It's called Patient Care Partners, and Debbie Deutsch is the owner of the organization. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the fee is, but she does. She and her um, colleagues do meet with the person several times to get to know you and know what your wishes are. Um, if you if you complete, so we, we basically just talked about the state of Wisconsin form, but um, the, I would encourage you, if you don't have anyone to nominate, to look at completing the living will, um, as well as look at the honoring choices document in Wisconsin. 
Um, that document, you can actually check a box saying you don't have anybody to nominate and you want your physicians to respect your wishes. Um, but definitely you can reach out to your healthcare in, um, providers, uh, ask for a social work referral and see if they can help guide you as well in terms of what to fill out if you don't have anybody to nominate. Great, thank you, Rebecca. I do not Great see any questions. Yeah, I do not see thank any you. other questions right now. So I think if anybody does have a question, you can throw it in that question box and we'll just give you a second here if there's anything else. And just to um, also let you know those, those forms that um, Rebecca talked about in the presentation are in that handout section. So, um, and you can also get those through the DHS site, I think. Um, but we did put those in the handout section. So if you want to just take a look at those as well. Otherwise, I don't think we have any other questions, Rebecca. Well, thank you for the invitation and for your time. Thank you, everybody.